for Legacy Land Trust Society. I am introducing and welcoming um, the other staff members. Jane, Mary Jane Block is our conservation director and Kim Good is our chair and font of all knowledge. And um, we um, are really happy to have Dan McPherson of Elevator Law um, come on and share conservation in the law with us. And I'm pretty much gonna turn it over to him after two housekeeping things. Um, there will be Q and A at the end and Mary Jane will take your questions in the chat box and transfer them and read them out loud to Dan. And um, this is being recorded. We'll record it in such a way that uh, you guys all remain anonymous. And the final thing is there will be an evaluation, but not till the end of the whole series. So uh, nothing much exciting there. So welcome, and I hope you find this interesting. It's all yours, Dan. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan McPherson. Um, I'm a lawyer uh, here in Olds. I've practiced in Olds for about the last seven years now. Um, I realized with this presentation that I've made it pretty much a year into this pandemic without having to host um, a Zoom webinar. I've certainly attended a lot. Uh, so I just wanted to apologize in advance for any technical issues. Uh, those are entirely mine, uh, not on legacy. And uh, yeah, I look forward to interacting as much as we're able to in this environment. And I've prepared probably about half an hour or so of speaking points. Um, again, to the extent that we're able to, I'd love to welcome questions and interact. Um, and we'll go from there. So today's presentations uh, entitled Conservation in the Law, an introduction to conservation easements under the Alberta Land Stewardship Act. It really is an introduction. Uh, there's a lot to cover, but my hope is to equip you with the tools that you could go uh, learn more about it and hopefully be better oriented in uh, the world of conservation easements. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide here. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Dan McPherson and uh, I uh, recently opened up my own practice here in Olds uh, under my professional corporation of Daniel R. McPherson Professional Corporation. And I wanted to pick a trade name that uh, would resonate with rural Albertans, uh, resonate with residents of Olds in Mountain View County. And uh, so I picked Elevator Law, inspired by our grain elevators and uh, what they symbolize and represent. So hard work and payoff and forward thinking. Uh, today is my first double digit day of running my own law practice. I'm on day 10 today, so it's certainly early days. Um, but I've had the privilege of working with Legacy uh, over the past um, two plus years now and have really enjoyed working with Legacy and I find uh, it's just a good uh, a good combination um, of I think my skill sets uh, working with a lot of real estate clients throughout Mountain View County over the last um, six plus years um, and then also my personal experiences growing up so I grew up in Ontario and um, there's a really incredible trail network in Ontario called the Bruce Trail. And I was looking it up this morning just to have my details right. And it's about a 900 kilometer trail that runs the Niagara Escarpment in Ontario. And uh, part of that was close to um, uh, our property growing up. And I have very, very fond memories of these large tracts of land um, that were uh, donated to the Bruce Trail. And I just remember thinking how incredible that people had the foresight to not develop this and that it can just be us here enjoying it. Um, so I think my experiences with, with the Bruce Trail growing up um, dovetailed very well when I met Legacy and, and understood more about um, its mission and, um, and purpose. And as I mentioned, it's really just been a privilege to work with them for the last couple of years here. Uh, so no slideshow would be complete with a lawyer without a good disclaimer in it. Um, I'm happy to talk. Um, everything that I will cover, though, really is just for general informational purposes. Uh, every situation is fact specific. And so I would encourage everyone 
on the call to uh, consult with a lawyer about the specifics of, uh, of your easement or whatever you're interested in. Um, again, I'm more than happy to, to weigh in on it just for my own liability. I just wanted to put it in here that this is just for general informational purposes. So I don't know, um, Mary Jane, is there a way to just sort of pull participation from our attendees today? Um, as in, I can they put up a think hand? I can have, set up. Well, yeah. Um, that, that tech advanced, just can we raise a hand or anything like that? I it can. Think, yeah. Thanks, Perfect. Kim. On the bottom of their screens, if people move their mouse down to the bottom, it'll bring up chat, share, uh, record. Perfect. There's a reactions. You can raise your hand, give a thumbs up in there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Carrie so just did it. Part, part of why I'd like to encourage interaction, um, having just opened up my own civil practice, I've, I've spent a good chunk of time just talking to myself for the last um, little bit here. <laughs> and so I would love some interaction, to be honest. Um, so just for my own curiosity, who is a private land owner of our attendees today interested in, uh, interested in, in a possible conservation easement with their property? just by a show of thumbs up or hands. Okay, couple there. And then I think we have some other, you know, stakeholders for lack of a better term, maybe in, um, involved with other land trusts, um, maybe friends of legacy, any show of hands there. Okay, perfect. Um, good. Well, in, in preparing this presentation, um, my approach as a lawyer might be a little different. I like to start with the basics. I really do, because I often find that sometimes we forget about the basics. And then as we get on to the more complex things, the basics weren't really covered off properly. Um, and then it just leads to greater problems down the line. So I thought I'd start just with an overview of a land title, which I know, again, might seem very uh, basic, but it really is the foundation um, to the conservation easement. And if you don't have a good foundation, then everything gets a little bit more complicated uh, as we move on. So again, maybe just by a show of hands, do most people know how to go pull a copy of their land title? Got one there. Hand clap, way to go, Amy. Lisa, I would hope so. Okay, well, this might be a review then, but uh, for those that uh, didn't clap or thumbs up, we'll just go over that. So this, here's the link in the slides. It's a pretty long uh, handle there. You can also just Google uh, SPIN2, S-P-I-N, and then the numeral two. Uh, and then you can enter as a guest here where it says guest login. Um, and so this is the spatial information system. We refer to it as SPIN2. Um, and this is uh, basically the online land titles office in the province. So you can enter in as a guest. You don't need to set up um, an account or anything like that. And then you'll kind of get to this home page here. And then if you go to search, you can uh, search by the legal description of the property. Um, and I think the land titles office charges $10 or something like that to pull a copy of your title. Um, this was just an image that I found online. Uh, this I think was from the, um, it'll come to me in a second, the farmer's advocates office put this out. Um, and so just walking through the land title, again, it may seem basic, but lots of times these things are missed and it creates a lot of problems. So you wanna make sure that you're dealing with the right legal description. So sometimes if you've had a subdivision taken out of the property um, or if you just have more than one parcel of land, it's not, that, it's not unheard of that you'll actually be dealing with the wrong piece of property um, and everything is kind of tainted from there. So you'll have the proper legal description here. You would need to provide that to legacy or your lawyer. Uh, it really is the starting point for, for dealing with any land. We then have the registered owners of the property. So again, why that's significant is the land might actually be owned by a corporation, right? It may be in one person's name uh, and you need to consider dower rights, which I'll speak about um, in a bit more detail here. 
Uh, maybe it's registered in the names of more than one um, uh, owner. And so you would then need um, consensus from both of those owners uh, for granting that conservation easement. And then the one that I find um, tends to get by people as well relates to the encumbrances on the title. So this is just a generic example here, right? We have a couple caveats, we have a restrictive covenant, and then we have a mortgage as well. And why that's significant is if you've already given rights um, in the property to others, that may prevent you from then uh, encumbering that land further with say uh, legacy or through a conservation easement. So again, I know it seems very basic, but I'd say kind of next step, if you're interested from here, it doesn't hurt to go check your land title. Um, I don't think this one shows it, but on a land title issued by the land titles office, it will have the date that the title was last pulled. So it's also good to take a look at that because you might go, yeah, this is the title, but it's actually from 20 years ago. And then you, and I'm happy to help anyone with this if they're interested, just give me a call. But you can um, basically compare it to the current title through SPIN2 there to see if anything has changed. Um, any questions at this point? Um, as far as questions go, um, if you want, when Dan pauses and asks, you can unmute yourself and ask a question or pop it in the chat. Either way, um, I'll try to keep an eye on those. And um, uh, it just offers a couple options for interaction. Uh, Dan, does a pipeline uh, pose a problem to a uh, land trust? And sorry, that, that's um, Mr. Mills here, is that correct? Yes. Perfect. Um, I would say not necessarily. Um, Lisa Kennedy was a classmate of mine and she can attest that uh, in law school, the professors used to love to say it depends, which was just infuriating, right, as an answer to a law student. It really does depend though. Um, so each of these encumbrances here, I think, um, Mr. Mills, you can still see my the land title up here on the screen, right? So all it tells us is caveat surface lease, right? Or a restrictive covenant. So you'd really have to dig into each one of those instruments to see uh, the specifics of those instruments. But certainly my experience has been, um, you know, most land that, that has come across my desk has some form of encumbrance on it, uh, utility right away, um, pipelines, um, access roads, that sort of thing. And to my knowledge that hasn't uh, been an issue in negotiating the conservation easement. Kim, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on that point. The only thing I would say, like we, what we'll do um, at some point is pull each caveat um, listed on title. And m most of the reclamation plans on, if there is one for a pipeline, which generally there isn't because the intention is that it will just get left or abandoned at some point when it's not used. But um, Say we had put in the in the easement that uh, the land would be vegetated to native species at some point or left to naturalize, but the reclamation plan on a well site or a pipeline said it would go to agricultural crops. Um, we'd want to have some discussions between the landowner and the company who had that caveat. That's very rare. Usually it says it will go back to like a topographical goal, but occasionally I have seen them where it um, or especially early ones where they would say kind of what crops will go, but that that would be the only challenge and it's completely manageable. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, some things to consider. Do we have the right legal description of the property? Who are the registered owners of the property? Uh, what encumbrances, if any, are registered on title? And then I thought I'd flag as well dower rights. So uh, some of you may be familiar with dower rights in the province, others not. If uh, land has been registered in the name of one owner and that owner or their spouse have resided on that land since the time of their marriage. So even if they don't live there anymore, uh, it may still be captured by dower rights. And so even though the other spouse's name may not be on title, granting that conservation easement is uh, a disposition of interest in that property. And so the spouse may need to sign off on it as well. It likely wouldn't be an issue, but um, 
certainly in my experience, dower rights can sometimes creep up at kind of the 11th hour and catch everyone off guard. Um, the agreement itself would still be signed off by the registered owner, but you would um, uh, need to consider the dower right aspect there as well. And so we can start to talk uh, more now about conservation easements. And so again, just wanting to equip everyone uh, with the tools after the presentation to learn more if they'd like to. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a website called Canly. Canly is a tremendous resource if you haven't come across it before. Uh, so it's C-A-N-L-I-I.org. And Canly is basically a Google for uh, legislation and case law in Canada. So you have the uh, document text here or the case names if you wanted to search by a keyword, you'd put that in here in the document text or you can search by the actual legislation. So from Canley, if you are interested in pulling the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, it's, it's a good place to go access it. And this is just a, a screenshot here of the beginning of that legislation. But in order to understand conservation easements, you have to understand the, the legislative authority for those conservation easements. And that is derived uh, from the Alberta Land Stewardship Act here. And um, so once you have a copy of uh, the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, um, it's sections, I think it was about 28 to 35. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that much to take in um, of the Alberta Land Stewardship Act. Sorry, I'm just playing with different screens here on my screen. Um, it sets out uh, details on conservation easements. And so it's important to understand that a conservation easement really is uh, different from most easements um, that I think most of us would be familiar with. I certainly discovered that it was very different from most easements uh, that I was familiar with when I started to work with legacy. So in my experience as a lawyer, you would normally come across an easement where <clears throat> someone needs to use a laneway that crosses the neighbor's property to access their property. And so an easement is where one landowner grants uh, an interest to a neighboring landowner to cross their property to access the other property. Um, and then that's registered on title as an easement. And the process uh, for a standard easement is such that the two landowners get together, they sign off on an easement agreement that's submitted to the uh, Alberta Land Titles Office, and then it gets registered on title. And so when I started to work with Legacy and we needed to register a uh, conservation easement, I thought, well, no problem, we'll just you know send it into the Land Titles Office. Uh, and then I quickly discovered that it's a, it's a much more complex process. It involves a lot more parties. Uh, the timing is different. And, and that really highlighted for me that conservation easements, even though they're called easements, uh, they really are a different, uh, a different vehicle altogether. So I think understanding the terminology is important because you'll use a lot in your conservation easements. And so we start with the term, uh, well really here they've got grantee just because it's alphabetical, but it really starts with the grantor. And so the grantor is the landowner uh, that grants a right um, through primarily the conservation easement. Um, I had the chance to review Kim's um, recorded session from last week, which I would encourage you to do as well if you didn't attend that session. Um, there are other tools in Legacy's toolbox than just the conservation um, easements, but for the purposes of today's talk, I'll focus uh, just on the conservation easement vehicle. So we have the grantor, which is the landowner that grants an interest to the grantee. And so the grantee under the Alberta Land Stewardship Act needs to be a qualified organization, which fortunately uh, Legacy is uh, a qualified organization. But right out of the gate, this is different from a standard easement, right? You can't just grant a conservation easement to anyone uh, that you please. Um, it does have to be in accordance with, um, with the act here. So we've covered some of this, right? We have the grantor, the one who grants the rights, the grantee, the one that receives the benefit of the rights. And then we start to get into this language like running with the land, a negative covenant, a positive covenant, and then a caveat. 
And I know uh, Kim mentioned some of this language again in her presentation last week, but I think it is important to understand what these terms mean. Um, they look like plain English, but they are terms of art and they have particular uh, important meanings. So running with the land uh, means that that is not a personal promise between that landowner and that grantee. That is a promise which then binds that parcel of land into the future. So it's a very strong agreement. It doesn't depend on the enforcement of any one individual. It's not a license. Uh, it is something that binds that parcel of land and runs with that land. We then get into the terms negative covenant and positive covenant. So here's another um, way in which conservation easements uh, diverge from a more, uh, more standard easement in that um, under an easement that you might create with your neighbor or, or a restrictive covenant um, that you put on title, uh, the obligations or the promises need to be negative in nature, meaning it's something that you uh, basically are prevented from doing. This is compared with a positive covenant, which relates to something that you actually have to do. And so what's interesting about conservation easements is they allow for both negative covenants and positive covenants. Um, when I was thinking about this, I realized, well, the reason you'd have a negative covenant is because it's a lot easier to just say, don't do something, right? And to go get an injunction from a judge if someone is, is uh, violating that, as opposed to, we actually need you to do something here. Um, I was asking Kim just before the Zoom call started, if she had any examples of positive uh, covenants in restrictive, uh, or sorry, conservation easements that Legacy, Legacy signed off on. Uh, we couldn't think of any offhand. The agreements or the, the easements tend to be set up to say, well, these are things that you are um, uh, not allowed to do in the interest of conserving the land. And these are other permissible um, activities that can be completed on the land. But we haven't, uh, at least in my experience, gone as far as an actual positive covenant saying you need to do this uh, with respect to the land as well. But it is interesting for me, I, I think as a lawyer and just looking at the legal um, vehicle as a whole that it does allow for positive covenants. So there is lots of room to work within um, conservation easements that uh, go beyond a standard easement. And then we have the term caveat. I just threw that in there because sometimes there's a bit of a misunderstanding in my experience about a caveat. So a caveat does not create legal rights. A caveat is designed as a tool to uh, register something on title with relative ease to say, I believe I have valid rights in this property and I wish to um, basically protect or secure that claim through the caveat. But the caveat itself is neutral and doesn't actually create uh, legal rights. Why that's significant is a caveat is also easier to get off the title than say a, conserva or a conservation easement. And so with a caveat, there's a process where if there's a caveat on your title and you're not particularly happy with it, you can serve notice on the caveator to have that caveat discharged. And then they have a certain amount of time to respond to that uh, notice. And then if they don't, then the caveat automatically lapses from title. Um, that is not the case with a conservation easement. Once that is registered on title, there's no um, option to simply serve notice and have it expire after 60 days. And so I think just if you're interested in this to understand the language and the vehicles is important so that uh, you really wouldn't refer to it as, oh, well, let's register a caveat on title. You may register um, uh, the conservation easement by caveat if you were having some sort of issues with just getting registration, it's a bit of a workaround. Um, but the agreement itself is set up uh, such that you can't knock it off without the um, permission from, uh, from the grantee. Any questions at this point? All right, hearing none. So another um, really good resource, if you're interested in educating yourself on this more, or even just on land titles in general, um, the Alberta Land Titles Office has a policies and procedures manual. I normally just Google Land Titles Office procedures manual. And uh, under that, they have particular manuals for particular areas of law. So there is one on uh, conservation easements in particular. Uh, it's only three pages long. Um, and it's, 
it's primarily an overview of the technical aspects of registering uh, the conservation easement, but it normally gives a good summary here on the background as well. So we have things like conservation easements may be registered at the land titles office and run with the land and then be enforced whether they are positive or negative in nature. And notwithstanding that the grantee does not have an interest in any land that would be benefited um, by the conservation easement. So as a lawyer, it's always a very helpful um, uh, first, first point to go Okay, I need a quick overview of, uh, of this area. Uh, let's look at some of the technical processes. Let's look at some of the uh, legislation that applies. And so I would encourage you to check out the procedures manual on conservation easements. And again, the link is there uh, to access. That may just take you to the procedures manual um, sort of homepage there, and then you can find uh, pretty easily the conservation um, easement one in particular. So just with this up on the screen, another interesting part about conservation easements is uh, with a standard easement, you have what's called the dominant tenement and then the servient tenement. So some of you may have come across those terms before. Um, so the dominant tenement receives the benefit of whatever um, that sort of easement is or that restriction is. And then the servient tenement uh, is basically gets the short end of the stick and is left being encumbered in some way because of that. What's different about conservation easements is that the grantee doesn't actually have to have an interest in the land, right? And so that, that's what, what allows legacy to work with so many different landowners. They don't need to own the land next to it. Um, so even though they have no interest in the land that's being affected or even the neighboring parcel, um, so basically the, um, the servient tenement exists on its own without a dominant tenement, uh, which again is, is a special aspect of conservation easements. And check here. Uh, so sorry, I see Jill here. You had a question. The easement would not take precedence over mineral rights. Correct. Um, Jill, are you able to hop on a on a microphone there? All right. There. Okay, it's, it's buffering a little bit, but I can certainly answer that. So with the land title, maybe I'll just go back a couple slides here. Um, it basically runs chronologically. So whenever something is registered on title, um, it, um, whatever is ahead of it on title trumps that other instrument, right? So oftentimes we'll have the first charge mortgage and then a second charge mortgage. So when you're dealing with the interest on the title, you start at the first one and you work your way through. Now you can get something called a postponement, which is where even though something appears on title um, ahead of another instrument, we would then register a postponement saying, we actually wanna flip those such that this interest um, is subject to this interest. Um, so I think you would have a hard time convincing anyone else registered on title to postpone uh, their interests to uh, the interest of the conservation easement. Um, one, sometimes it just comes down to manpower that to actually get someone who's willing to respond in that way um, at some of these you know, various organizations would be a bit of a nightmare. Um, but to answer the question, maybe I'll just pull it back up here so I'm addressing it properly. Uh, sorry, I can't find my chat function here. Um, but no, it would not necessarily take precedent over these other instruments unless you specifically obtained a postponement uh, from the various holders. Can you hear me now? Yes. Would any easement would follow along there. Like if an oil company wants to go onto your place, they have the right to be there because of the mineral rights. Um, sorry, it just cut out at the beginning there. Do you mind repeating it again, please, Jill? I think 
Um, Jill, you're buffering, so but I think I know what you're asking. So I think she's saying if you have a conservation easement on a property and a um, uh, uh, oil company comes to drill, can you stop them or is it, do they still have the right to go ahead? Is that correct, Jill? Yes, she just texted yes. Okay. Um, again, I would say it depends on their position on title. Um, but but this is if they're not so. Um, this is if not if they're on title, but it's exploratory. Oh right. Yeah. So so subsurface rights um, are still in existence. Like so, no, the easement can't stop them. But there are examples um, where land trusts have said to because so if a if a oil or gas company came to a landowner and said that they wanted to. Um, um, do some drilling or do some exploration, then they tell the landowner they're required to also tell the land trust because they do have an interest in the land. And um, for the most part, uh, they're quite receptive to that and will generally um, either directional from another property. Um, and they are always quite good at, um, my experiences, they're always quite good at being very receptive to maybe a, <laughs> a higher standard of reclamation that they might have to do otherwise. Um, but I've had a few move away from a property that has had an easement on it in the past. I think that same question came up maybe at one of the last presentations we did, Kim, where there was some issue about accessing you know, water and I think the um, the response was the same, right? That maybe it can't stop it entirely, but it certainly um, it is a good way to uh, draw attention to the conservation of, of the land. Yeah, it, it lends itself well to opening the door to that kind of conversation. Um, and as I say, like I've always had uh, oil and gas companies be receptive to that conversation. Yeah. Um, we actually, and in our in our specific conservation easement and most of the land trusts in the province, we do have a, a clause in it that says if oil and gas activity is going to happen, here's the um, minimum requirements for reclamation or even access, like how they, how they do the exploration itself. They need to follow. It used to be minimizing impact to grassland. It was held by the EUB. Now it's been moved and I can't remember where the new place is, but it is corrected and updated in our, in our document. Um, Kim, just while I have you, there's another question that came in uh, from Tom and Tracy here. So it says, my understanding is that other easement holders have the opportunity to comment on new CEs. And off the top of my head, I'm just thinking of the, um, the regulations, right, and the notice that's required to register the uh, the conservation easement. And off the top of my head, you you're not required to provide notice to the other um, easement holders on title. And I don't know if we've done that in the past. Can you comment so, on that? Yeah. So Tom's in Saskatchewan, and I used to know their legislation really well, and I don't remember that specifically. Um, yeah. But in Alberta, we do not have to reach out to any easement holders unless we want to request any other easement holders on title, unless we want to request a postponement. A postponement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we also have, I assume that once a conservation easement is in place, any amendment to that easement would need to be mutually agreed to uh, between the land owner and the trustee. Um, off the top of my head, yes, right? Any sort of amendment uh, needs to be um, captured in writing. And, and I know there's a bit of a different process for registering uh, the amendment to the conservation easement. Um, now, Kim, do you know offhand though, did we have anything in previous easements where legacy can make changes unilaterally without the consent of the of the landowner? No, no, it always would have to be mutually agreed upon. There is room within the Alberta legislation that the minister responsible for the act, who is currently the minister of environment and protection or environmental and environment and parks, pardon me, um, that they can uh, request a change. Um, but there's sort of all kinds of tax implications of a major change. So right. um, it's highly unlikely. Um, again, off the top of my head, I think though we put in the conservation easements that legacy can assign the interest to another um, qualified organization. Do I have that right? 
Yes. So if we were to um, no longer exist as an organization, uh, we have a clause in that says that we would um, we would pass the easement on to a like organization, but not for any other reason. Right. So not necessarily a material change, but some things can change within uh, within the agreements. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Great. Thank you for the uh, the questions, everyone. So we've gone over those, we've gone over the procedures manual. Um, another great resource, I know Kim shared it uh, last week with her presentation, um, but it's, and I think the link was maybe sent out last week as well. Um, but this, this page really is an incredible resource on conservation easements. Um, and yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Dan, before you get too far into this one, there's just one more related question that sure. um, came up. Um, are there examples of uh, where a CE has been amended by the trust and a subsequent landowner? Okay. Um, um, yeah, I would say there probably are. I, I wouldn't say no, actually. The And the reason I hesitate on that is um, th there likely would. However, the land trust... Uh, each land trust starts with the original vision and the original agreement is that that's any change has to be in line with the long term vision of the original landowner. So there may be a change, but it's it, any of the ones that I can think of that might qualify to answer as a yes to this question are um, all done in keeping with the original intent. I could think of an example where, you know, maybe you weren't anticipating needing a building site right in the in the original one and then you wish to build something right that, that can still keep with the vision and the intent of the original agreement and so you might amend the schedule in that way yeah or, or one other one i would think of like if it if there is a building site allowed and they want to make some changes to that like make it smaller or um adjust something due to the water wet like the well that gets drilled or some sort of um, municipal bylaw requirement that doesn't the ce doesn't align with so yeah it would generally be around those kinds of items and um, one more question. Um, yeah. Can two land trusts hold the same easement? Off the, um, off the top of my head, probably not would be my guess, right? That you would have two, two qualified organizations signing off on the same uh, CE. Um, but that CE, again, might be transferred from one uh, land trust to another. Kim, do you think I'm on the mark with that? Yeah, so uh, BC legislation allows two to be named uh, at the beginning. Ours doesn't. I can't remember Saskatchewan's. Um, we can, what we can do though is assign within the easement a different land trust to monitor it. So say uh, Legacy held the easement, um, but it was in a region where we don't have a lot of other projects. And so maybe we assign a local land trust there to do the monitoring or something along those lines. So we can partner with other land trusts, but the document itself is between just two parties. All right. Um. So again, I would encourage everyone, I find I just attend so many of these Zoom webinars and there's so much information that's sort of thrown at you uh, in a pretty short period of time that it's hard for it to stick. So uh, I would encourage everyone um, to check out this website uh, created by the Environmental Law Center and Mistakis Institute. Um, it really is very well put together and has good bite-sized pieces on, you know, what is a conservation easement? What sort of thing should we consider in granting a conservation easement? Um, I, I didn't focus too much on the actual contents of the conservation easement, um, largely because it's a little hard to talk about in the abstract. Um, I'm sure that we could provide some, um, some precedents and there's also obviously some that are, are registered on titles, which are a matter of public records to see what they look like. Um, they are a contract at the end of the day. And so they follow a lot of the provisions of a standard contract. So setting out uh, those negative um, covenants, those positive covenants, 
Uh, it normally will include an indemnity provision. So if the qualified organization suffers some sort of a loss financially through um, some sort of action of the grantor, they have the right to try to uh, seek compensation from the grantor for that. Um, when I was watching Kim's session, she talks about how, you know, there's kind of the dreaming part. Uh, this is a bit of a day at you, Kim. Uh, the, there's the dreaming part, then there's the black and white legal part, which I think she she qualified as a bit boring. Um, it's it's on it's on the table. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, it's, I mean, it is and it isn't, right? I mean, it's boilerplate, but it's also legally binding on that owner and on anyone else who assumes uh, title to that property. So. I, I would just encourage everyone to, um, I think, treat it with the, the respect uh, that it deserves, right? It isn't sort of the whatever you're feeling at that moment. It is, it, you know, it's called legacy for a reason, right? It's, it's called um, a conservation easement for a reason. Uh, once it's on title, it's pretty hard to change that. And so I think you want to be very uh, firm in your, in your decision to enter into that agreement. I think it's an incredibly admirable um, step to take. Uh, as a lawyer, I would be more than happy to help uh, really anyone on the call uh, or, or others review those agreements in detail. Um, I can't recall offhand, I think they tend to run about sort of 10 to 20 pages. Uh, so there is a fair bit of information in there. And ultimately, I think it's about capturing your intention uh, and your desires uh, as a landowner um, and in such a way that legacy can succeed as well in the conservation of the land. Um, legacy is just such a fantastic institution in my experience. Uh, Carrie, Mary Jane um, and Kim have just been really wonderful to work with and um, I think make it very easy to want to get involved with legacy and, and support it as an organization. Um, with the registration of the conservation easement as well, just, just sort of on the legal sides of it, as it's a contract, as it's a registered encumbrance on title, as it runs with the land, uh, it can affect the ability to sell the land in the future realistically. It can affect the fair market value of the land um, because you are encumbering the use of the land in some way. Uh, the clients that I've worked with and the conservation easements that I've been a part of, everyone understands that very clearly, right? And, and that's, that's a positive to them. Um, and I do think it's positive, but I think it's important to understand that as well. Um, registering the conservation easement can make it uh, difficult to get financing, right? Using that land as security, because again, you've encumbered it, you've limited the uses uh, of that land. Another thing uh, to explain, if you're working with an organization uh, in, in having that agreement reviewed, I do think it's important to have uh, independent legal counsel in it. As some of you may or may not be aware, if you retain the same lawyer, that lawyer really has to remain a neutral party between the negotiating parties, between the grantor and the grantee. They can't favor the interests of one side over the other. And in addition, uh, under the rules or, or the code of conduct with the law society, there's no confidential information between what's discussed with the lawyer uh, by either the grantee or the grantor. So it's basically as if all three parties are in the same room at the same time. So it's not that common in my experience, but I would certainly encourage everyone to retain their own counsel in negotiating um, the ILA. It doesn't have to be a situation where everyone's lawyering up and it's contentious by any means. I think it's just, you know, this is a serious commitment that you're making and it's nice to have that, that legal counsel there that you can speak to candidly. Um, you can pose whatever question to that you want without them having to balance uh, the, uh, um, some of the limits uh, of, of the joint retainer. Um, and then I think sort of in final, uh, just maybe a final comment here, um, a conservation easement is, is a big deal. And there are lots of other ways to support a uh, legacy. They didn't ask me to say this. This really just kind of came to me as I was, as I was preparing for this presentation. Um, so if anyone's interested, you could also just go an easier route if you wanted to support legacy of leaving an actual legacy, uh, which is a specific term of art, meaning it's a cash gift in your will. Um, so it doesn't have to be during your lifetime, but you could certainly name them as a beneficiary of a specific gift. Um, I confirmed with Kim and Carrie earlier that they do have charitable status. 
I don't know if, um, if our speaker next week would speak to that at all. Uh, not so much about the conservation easement, but maybe just the benefits of leaving um, a legacy in your will uh, to a registered charity, but there's certainly some tax advantages there um, that, uh, that, that an accountant should speak to more than I can speak to. But I did want to offer that to say, if you're interested in supporting legacy or any other, um, any other charity, right, or with, with um, a particular interest in land conservation, uh, and you just don't want to go that far as the conservation easement route because it maybe doesn't work for you or because it doesn't come to the land more than you're comfortable with. There are certainly other, other options and steps to um, uh, through some forward uh, planning to benefit them. So a question came in, are there more steps to conservation easements donated through the EcoGift program? That I don't know and I'll have to defer to Kim on. There are, um, there are more steps. I think this will get covered next week. Who asked that question? That was um, Aaron. Aaron, Aaron, are you yeah, able I to- I work for Alberta Conservation Association. I just wasn't sure. <laughs> okay, okay. Trying to get as much information for myself as well. Yeah, so there, there are extra steps. They'll probably cover uh, it in more. Are you able to come next week, Aaron? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So if they don't, will you flag that? But I think he'll cover it. There, there's um, uh, application processes and the landowner needs to sign some documentations and it adds time. Basically, best case scenario, it will add th three months to the length of time to get an easement put into place. Okay, and then just, um, just popped in, um, if it's any conservation easement donated to you guys, the landowner do they receive a tax receipt for the appraised yes. value okay but that yep. will be next week is that more of an accounting oh it is yep never mind yep. i'll ask you again next week okay great thanks i have another question dan um sure. do i understand you to say that the ce contract is on title and therefore anyone can read the details yes um and i know we've I think addressed this with legacy recently of you know how much how much needs to be included as a matter of public record and how much can exist kind of offline. Um, I would say as a general rule, it it is a matter of public record once it's registered on title. Um, my again off the top of my head, I think there are parts of the agreement that maybe are referenced in separate documentation that don't don't actually get registered. Um, but certainly in order for it to be legally binding, it needs to be registered on title and anyone can then go in and pull a copy of that. And I think uh, there was another question to just about hiring uh, your own lawyer, but you answered that. Sure, yeah. Um, so that's really it. Uh, my contact information here, um, so I'm based out of Olds. It's a wonderful time to be practicing law um, because so much of it can be done through, through Zoom. Um, if anyone has any questions, really please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my, my slogan for Elevator Law is protect your life's work. And that's very genuine to me that we've all worked very hard for wherever we are in life. And uh, I, I know land conservation um, means so much to so many of us. And so if I can be part of that in any way, that's an honor to me. Um, and again, my personal experience working with Legacy, everyone's in good hands. And I'm open for any other questions that you guys may have. So yes, feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, verbally, or you can pop it in the chat box if you have questions. You must have covered everything. Uh, Dan, oh, I have here's a one. question. Um, if, ahead, if you have a federal eco gift, does that, when you transfer the land or the, the new owner of the land, let's say, um, are they are there any tax implications? Are there any legal implications for that new owner? 
Um, so admittedly on the, on the eco gift front, I don't have as much experience just because I'm normally brought in once the conservation easement um, agreement has been signed off or, or um, pretty much signed off and we're looking more at registering it on title. Um, so I don't know about the eco gift aspect of it in particular. Um, the transfer uh, is significant for the future owners. I know uh, Legacy's um, conservation easement agreement sets out that the future owners also need to sign off on agreeing to the conservation easement. Um, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they would be legally bound anyways, but the agreement anticipates that we'd go a step further and get a, uh, an actual acknowledgement by the new landowner. Um, that, as far as I know, doesn't um, doesn't touch the tax aspects of it. And as far as I know, there wouldn't be any further sort of uh, tax implications for the future owners. Um, but I also haven't been involved on any properties that have transferred since the since the um, CE was registered. Yeah. So on the on the eco gift certification front, um, it is. Um, the main obligation after land ownership changes, so I'm going to step one back, one step back. Eco gift certification only has significant impact on the land once an easement has been registered or it's been donated to a land trust. So that even if a property has eco gift, it's been recognized by eco gift until um, an easement or a transfer happens. It's just kind of extra information. Once an easement is registered, the main implication to eco gift is um, something called change of use. So somebody asked the question about can they change, can subsequent landowners change? And I said, there's big ta tax implications. So eco gift is kind of like a second layer watchdog. <laughs> so if, um, if the land trust and, the, uh, sec and a subsequent landowner made a change that was not in line and was not in line with the original landowner and um, approved by eco gift, then the land trust is on the hook for 50% of the fair market value, current fair market value of the land at the time of that change. So the long-term benefit of eco gift is really kind of a, an extra level of um, watching what's happening or an extra level of protection so that things can't just be changed randomly. Does that answer? I, I'm sorry, I missed who had asked that question. Uh, Mr. Mills. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Does that answer yeah, the question? Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I get that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so a couple other questions that have come in through the chat here. Uh, so are the acts and regulations around CE similar across provinces? I've only looked at Alberta's, but my sense from Kim's comments is that they do vary uh, in that you can have more than one uh, qualified organization be a party to it. They uh, do. Sorry, I'll send, um, I actually have a paper that I did for the federal government in 2007. Tom, I'll send you that. The front page is a summary of all the, uh, or the front section is a summary of all the legislation across the country. Um, it is, um, there's been some changes since, like Alberta's now has agriculture where it didn't in the past, but. And then just another question here from Mr. Bayer. Uh, if I understand correctly, if a landowner breaches the terms of the CE, the only remedy would be recovery of any financial loss to do this. Uh, the trust would have to make the case that it suffered a loss and to what degree is this correct? Um, I'd say not necessarily. I think that just comes down to the terms of the contract. I've just skimmed here um, one of the precedents that we've used before with legacy. Um, and it does set out that legacy is entitled to any remedies available to it. So. I think it would be more nuanced than just, well, what's the dollar amount, right, for the destruction uh, to the property. Um, and so that, I think that's a good example, right, of, of that's where the, the uh, conservation easement um, uh, does a lot of heavy lifting in setting out as agreed to between the parties, what legacy is allowed to do, what it's allowed to step in to do, and then what sort of remedies are available to it. Okay. Um, well, this is this has been a, a, a privilege for me. Thank you, everyone, for for attending. Um, again, if you have any questions, 
please just let me know. I'd be happy to to weigh in. My website isn't up yet. Um, there's just a lot. Of, I'm wearing a lot of hats these days, apparently. Um, it will be soon, but the phone number and the email there, I monitor uh, quite regularly. So if you have any questions, just reach out. Thanks, Dan. That was great. And thank you, everybody, for all your questions and interaction. Um, we'll do the same. Uh, once this is up on YouTube, I'll send a link. And um, uh, any questions that come in between now, thank you very much. And please feel free to share them. And we'll see you all in a week. Thank Dan, thanks again for asking, answering questions, too. Yeah, and thank just you, a Dan. A plug our speaker next week. Uh, I had the, uh, the privilege of presenting with him and Kim a couple years ago as well, and, and he's great. So, well okay. worth your time. Good. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. I think that's it. We'll just hang here until you guys are done. If anybody has anything, just let us know. Um, is Tom still on? Yes, looks like it. Okay, he had just asked a question in the chat. I saw that um, about the requirement to monitor. Um, I, the legislation across the country is actually weak in conservation easements for the requirement to monitor. Um, it's really become a best practice of organizations to decide how they're gonna monitor the easements over time. We have a requirement as land trusts through the legislation to take care of the um, rights that were given to us and so um, Legacy has a, a stewardship policy that says we'll put boots on the ground once a year. Um, every other organize, some organizations do three years feet on the ground and they're, and they're doing flyover or drone monitoring or relying on a like sort of a nature steward kind of group. So everybody is a little bit different in that regard and the legislation does not dictate um, how it must happen across the country. You're so happy that my first uh, hosting session did not descend to me turning into a cat meme. So, <laughs> all right, still time. No, it was good. Great. Now we're. Uh... It's always also the learning of. Uh webinar protocol. You could probably stop recording, Mary Jane, so I don't babble incessantly here. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for attending.